Take your Bibles out and turn to Isaiah chapter 25. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 25. This will be the focus of our study together tonight. It's been said that nearly one-third of the Old Testament is written in poetic language. Now, naturally, when we think about the poetry of the Bible, songs, right? That's the first thing that comes to my mind, but we need to make sure that we don't limit ourselves to the songs when we think of that poetry. There's poetry in Proverbs, Lamentations, Song of Solomon, most of Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, much of Job, Hosea, Joel, Amos. They wrote in poetry. And so did Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 25, we have three songs recorded for us. Three songs of praise and triumph about the almighty God. The first song is found in the first five verses of Isaiah 25, and it's a praise of God for the great things that he has done. And then when we move down to verses 6 through, uh, through 8, we have the song of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a little prophetic there, isn't it? And the end of death. And then the final song, verses 9 through 12, is the ultimate triumph of God over his enemies. Tonight, let's take a few minutes and, and study together Isaiah chapter 25 and each of these songs that are found. Read with me verses 1 through 5 as we begin. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For you have made a city a ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you. For you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the blast of the terrible one is as a storm against the wall. You will reduce the noise of aliens as heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud. The song, the song of the terrible ones will be diminished. This song this praise of God for the great things that he has done starts on a very personal note. The prophet says, Lord, you are not our God. You are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. Now certainly Isaiah was talking on behalf of the nation, but he brought it to a very personal level when he did that. Sometimes we sing songs that have those personal pronouns. 
in them. And when we're singing songs, what are we doing it for? We're, we're entertaining each other, right? No. We're not entertaining each other. We're teaching each other. We're admonishing each other. But the primary purpose of our singing is to worship God. To praise Him. And to glorify Him. Sometimes the pronouns that we use are group pronouns. We sang a song this morning. Father, we love you. But you know what? We could sing that with the personal pronoun individually too, can't we? Father, I love you. I worship and adore you. Glorify your name in all the earth. When we sing those songs, we should be singing on a congregational level, but also on an individual level at the same time. We need to mean the words that we sing when we sing them. So Isaiah starts with that personal, you are my God. I will exalt you. Let's make a note very quickly about those terms found in that very first line. Oh Lord, you are my God. Now, if you have the American Standard Version, it's O Jehovah, Yahweh. It's a specific term that relates to God's faithfulness, his trustworthiness. But that second word, God, as translated from, from Elohim, it refers to his lordship, to his almighty nature. He is not only trustworthy, but he's powerful enough to fulfill the promises he makes. O oh Lord, you are my God. And then Isaiah talks about the wonderful things that he has done. You have made a city a ruin. A fortified city, a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. And this divine destruction that was accomplished by God resulted in glorification and fear. The strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you. <laughs> Isaiah doesn't identify the specific city here, does he? Because it refers to many cities, doesn't it? Think about the city of Thebes in Egypt. The city of Babylon. The city of Nineveh. These were great, mighty cities. Powerful. They lie in ruins today. They lie in ruins because of man's folly. Not because of man's greatness. God is the one who is great. God is the one who can lift a city up. And can cause a city to fall. But there's a sense of protection here. In verse 4, you've been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Is that not the most perfect description of the Lord's church that you've ever read? His church is a place where we can find refuge from the wickedness of this world. His church is a place where we can find strength from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Follow me, come unto me, ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
He offers us something that nothing else in the world can offer. He offers rest. He offers a refuge. He offers protection. Praise God for the great things he has done. Let's continue with the second psalm. Verses 6 through 8. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces. A feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the leaves. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people. And the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. The marriage supper of the Lamb is how we refer to that great feast often in the New Testament. Jesus frequently referred to feasts in the church among the people of the Lord. You can look at Luke chapter 14, you can look at Matthew uh, chapter 25, Matthew chapter 22, and you can see all of the symbolism that's found in those feast passages. And it's, it's a feast for all people, not just the Jews. We are included as well, the Gentiles. For all people to enjoy. It's been said that the feasts of the Mosaic dispensation were all shadows of the good things to come. There's a lot of those shadows and substances, types and antitypes between the Old Testament and New Testament. And we can see that the physical things that the people of the Old Testament, the Mosaic dispensation that they enjoyed in those feasts, it's a type for the enjoyment, the fellowship, the blessings that we receive in God's church today. Isaiah talks about the veil. In verse 7, he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. Now, there's a couple of different ways we can look at this. Number one, a veil was symbolic for suffering. And in this feast, that God prepares for his people, he takes away the causes of mourning. He takes away sin. He takes away suffering. And ultimately, he's going to take away even death. As he says in verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. When Jesus rose from that grave on the third day, he defeated the enemy that man had no possible way to defeat. Only God is powerful enough to defeat death. And one day, after we die, we will be raised as well. When Jesus comes again to call all of his elect, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He talks about how he's going to raise up the dead. 
We're going to join the Lord in the air. What a glorious thought. Yes, our life will end, but it won't end. We will exist forever because Christ has defeated death because God will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. He's going to take away our sorrow. He's going to take away our suffering. There's a song that's written by a member of the Lord's Church. Robert Arnold. No tears in heaven. It's a little inaccurate, isn't it? Because it doesn't say no tears. It says God will wipe away all tears. There's two references to Revelation in your outline. Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, and Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. Study those. And look at, at what exactly John says about tears. He doesn't say they won't exist. He says God's going to take care of them. God's going to wipe them away. The third song in Isaiah chapter 25, verses 9 through 12. The ultimate triumph of God over all his enemies. Verse 9, and it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For on this mountain, the hand of the Lord will rest. And Moab shall be trampled down under him. As straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. And he will spread out his hands in their midst as a swimmer reaches out to swim. And he will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hands. The fortress of the high fort of your walls, he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground down to the dust. How do you feel when people diminish your faith when they question your motivations when they mock you for your beliefs do you ever get discouraged do you ever feel like there's no way there's no way I can I can stand up to this. There's no way I can answer this. We have to keep our focus in the right place. Too many times we put the focus on ourselves. How am I going to overcome this? How am I going to answer their questions? God is more powerful than any question, than any mockery, than any discouragement we might feel. Read again verse 9. It will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. If you don't like it, too bad. We have waited for him, and he will save us. That makes me think of Romans. Uh, chapter 8. We talk about the unconditional love of God. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. If we are faithful, if we are obedient, 
if we follow the will of God, there's nothing that can separate us from the salvation that he offers. Nothing except ourselves. But we don't have to rely on ourselves. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How does he strengthen us? Through the word that the spirit has revealed. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. The more time we spend with God in his word, the stronger we will be in his service. And it's not us accomplishing anything. It's him working through us. Like Paul said to the Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered. God gave the increase. He is our God. He will save us. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Isaiah mentions Moab here. There are several scripture references there. And I invite you to study those on your own time. We're not going to take the time tonight to read those. But Moab here is representative of all the enemies of God and God's people. <coughs> Moab was, was ignoble in, in origin, <coughs> in history. Moab is used to typify the wicked oppression against God's people. They're described as proud and arrogant and boastful. They held God in derision and the dignity of man in contempt. Where is Moab today? Where is Nineveh? Where is Babylon? Where is Thebes? God's kingdom is still standing. The Lord's church is still here. The nations of this world rise and fall, but the Lord's kingdom will stand forever. There's great motivation in the promises and in the warnings of God. We know that he is faithful. We know that he is trustworthy. We know that he will keep his promises, both the good and and the bad. And there should be a, a, a level of fear, a level of terror when we consider that. If God says he's going to do something, God's going to do something. If we see that tsunami coming, we better start running, right? That's right. <laughs> We need to focus on our goal. We talked a little bit last week about the goal. Our goal is to get to heaven and to take as many people with us as we can. If you have a goal, not a wish, not a desire, but a goal, Aren't you going to do something about it? If you have a goal to get home tonight, you're going to get in a car and drive, right? Or ride in the passenger seat at least. And if you're driving, you're going to do your very best to not get hit by other cars. Because your goal is to get home. If your goal is to get to heaven, we can't just sit and wait for it to happen. We've got to do whatever we can to work in God's kingdom. 
Not only for ourselves, but for the second part of the goal to bring as many people with us as we can. Because God is faithful. Because God will keep his promises. And he will execute his warnings. Our goal is to follow the Bible. Then we need to study the Bible. We need to know what it says. So that we can be protected. So that we can be sustained. The gospel is full of provision. The feasts that are prepared. The gospel is all about salvation. The abolition of death. The gospel is about comfort. And even happiness. Because God, because God Promises to wipe away those tears. To remove those causes for mourning. To help us in our suffering. The enemies who have threatened and warred against God's people have come and gone. They've dissolved into dust one after another. And they will continue to dissolve into dust as long as God is gracious enough, merciful enough, and long-suffering enough to allow us to continue in this life. Are you a part of the Lord's kingdom? Not just a member who shows up to sit in a pew to warm the seat. Not just a two or three or four hour a week Christian. But an active soldier in the Lord's army. If we believe God's promises, if we believe what he has revealed in his word, we need to be active. We need to be singing these songs of triumph, these songs of praise, not only while we are gathered here together, but when we go home. When, we're with, when we are with our friends and our neighbors and our family. Let others see how important the gospel. How important salvation. How important Jesus is to each and every one of us. Not just as a group, but individually. Oh Lord, you are my God. If you can't say that tonight with all honesty and sincerity, make the changes that you need to make. Repent of whatever sin is in your life. If you're not yet a member of his body, be immersed into his body into Christ for the remission of sins. If you are a Christian, a child of God, but you have not been living the way that you should, repent and come back tonight. Do whatever you need to do to leave this building in right standing with God. If you need to respond to the invitation, do so now as we stand and as we sing.